so I'll share a bit about our work in the course of talking today, but um, I will share common justice develops and advances solutions to violence that meets the needs of those harmed, advances racial equity, and don't rely on incarceration. Um, at the core of our work, we operate an alternative to incarceration for serious violence rooted in restorative justice practices. And we came to do this in part because we knew that we couldn't end mass incarceration without addressing violence. That's partly just a matter of math. More than half of people locked up in the US are locked up for crimes of violence. And so we will not get to reductions of more than 50% by ignoring more than 50% of those incarcerated. But more than that, our attachment to incarceration in this country um, is about the stories we tell about violence, about who commits it, who's hurt, who needs protection, who should do that protecting. And those stories as we tell them are as old and frankly as racist as our nation. We formed a story of some imagined monstrous other from whom we need protection at any cost. And we have spent everything we have um, in the name of that story. We spent the money we could have spent on schools, that we could have sent, spent on roads, that we could have spent on, for example, a public health infrastructure capable of distributing a vaccine effectively and quickly. Um, and so we can't get past our addiction to incarceration without reckoning with the question of violence. But I also know that we cannot ask people to give up prison if we can't give them something in its place. It's not like with other crimes where you can say, just leave people alone, like that the, any harm they're doing is mostly to themselves. It's not the public's business. With violence, we have to be able to say what we will do instead. And so at Common Justice, we decided to build that. Um, we built a response that is centered on what survivors need and deserve, where we ask, like, when people are harmed, what do they need to heal? And how do we give that to them? And how do we keep our obligation to safety in a way prison hasn't? And so we knew from the start that we would be anchored in these core four principles. And I'll talk about those principles today as a way of sharing about our work. Um, and about restorative justice's place in um, the larger movement to right our justice system. So the first principle is that we believe responses to violence should be survivor-centered. This sounds familiar. We talk about doing things in victims' names all the time in the country. Um, victims are invoked as the reasons we do draconian sentencing policy and the reason we won't do bail and all sorts of other things. But our story of who victims are is artificially monolithic. Um, we typically portray victims as white women who want more jail, as a white woman who has survived rape, who has lost loved ones to murder. I know very clearly um, the pain and trauma white women can experience, but I also know that I am not representative of the vast majority of victims. A woman of color is measurably more likely than I am to be harmed. A young man of color is 10 times more likely to be robbed or assaulted than I am. And so our story of who victims are um, has always been false. But our story hasn't just been false about who victims are, it has also been false about what victims want. And so it's important to remember that fewer than half of survivors of violence call the police in the first place. Shame on us if we pretend our criminal justice system is victim-centered when we start at 50%. Another half of those will drop out before grand jury or the first preliminary evidentiary hearing. So we'll barely penetrate into that system before leaving it. So 75% of victims are telling us that what that system has to offer does not align with what they want and need. That is one of, to me, one of the most damning indictments of the criminal justice system I know. And there are a lot of competitors to be the most damning indictment of that system. At Common Justice, we take cases into the program with the consent of survivors. Um, so we only take them if the survivors want them. The survivors we work with are people who have engaged law enforcement, people who have made it past grand jury. So they're that 25% who are on the path to um, it with the system to securing an outcome likely to result in the incarceration of the person who hurt them. And we ask these survivors, do you want to see the person who hurt you incarcerated or do you want them in common justice? and 90% choose common justice, 90%. It's a wild number. 
Um, and it's hard to make sense of in the context of the stories we've been told about what victims want. When we first started seeing this number at Common Justice more than a decade ago, I had a brief period where I was very encouraged about humankind. <laughs> I thought we were more generous than I knew, more compassionate, more forgiving, that we thought, you know, but for the grace of God, go I. And that was true in some of the cases. But what was happening was something else, and it was something I should have known as a survivor myself. Um, so the best way I have been able to describe it is that as survivors, we will feel loss so deep that we would like wring out our bones to be free of it from like, the marrow there. Um, and we will feel fear so intrusive that in the safety of our own homes, in the arms of the people we love most, we will be unable to sleep. And when sleep exhaustion like, finally takes us, we will wake from that sleep with nightmares. And we will feel fear so all-consuming that it makes, or rage rather, all, so all-consuming, it makes us unrecognizable even to ourselves. But at the end of the day, we are pragmatic. There are two things we cannot abide. We cannot abide the idea of going through it again. And we cannot abide the idea of someone else going through what we went through. And so if we're presented with a choice, with our loss, with our fear, with our rage, we will choose the thing we think makes it most likely that those things we can't stand won't happen. And the hardest people to persuade that incarceration will keep them safe are people who live in neighborhoods where incarceration is common. They have paid for its failure with their enduring pain. Nowhere in human history has locked up as many people as we do in the United States. If incarceration produced safety, we would be the safest nation ever to have existed. And the black and brown neighborhoods in which that punishment has been most concentrated would be like these Edenic havens where if a kitten got hit by a car, we'd have to do a vigil because there'd be so little experience of pain. That is not what this response to violence has produced and people know it. So when survivors choose an alternative to incarceration, it's not because they're justice reformers necessarily, some maybe. It's not because they're abolitionists, some maybe. It's because they want to survive and they want others to survive. The second principle that guides our work at Common Justice uh, is we believe responses to violence should be accountability-based. That also sounds obvious, right? We always say people have to be held accountable. But in this country, we have conflated accountability and punishment. And the longer I do this work, the more I know not only are those two things not the same, I increasingly come to understand that they're incompatible. Punishment is passive. Punishment is something someone does to you. All you have to do to be punished is not escape it. Accountability is different. Accountability requires that you acknowledge what you've done, you acknowledge its impact, you make things as right as possible, ideally in a way defined by those harmed, you express genuine remorse, and you become somebody who will never cause that harm ever again. Accountability is some of the hardest work any of us will ever do. Um, I remember one of our participants early on who, um, he'd been getting involved since he was eight, he had seen more violence, experienced more violence, caused more violence in his, by that time, 19 years than any of us should experience in a lifetime. Um, and he was in the program, the young man he robbed was 14 at the time. And so first, like that young man's mom had the choice about whether to let him into common justice. I remember my conversations with her because she, um, she said to me, you know, first, when I first heard about what, that, what happened to my son, first I wanted that young man, she didn't use the word young man to talk about him, but I will edit her language for the purpose of this public conversation. She said, first I wanted that young man to drown to death, then I wanted him to burn to death. And then I realized as a mother, I don't want either of those things. I want him to drown in a river of fire so I don't have to choose. And she said, but three years from now, my nine-year-old boy is gonna be 12. And he's going to be going to and from school and to and from the corner store and to and from his aunt's house alone. And one of those days, he's going to see this young man on the street. 
And I have to ask myself on that day, do I want that young man to have been upstate in prison or do I want him to have been with y'all? And she said, and while if I had my machete, not a machete, my machete, that's like much more approximate risk. Um, if I had my machete, I would chop him to bits and bury him under my house and sleep for the first time since he dare lay his hands on my baby. The truth is I'd rather him be with y'all. Right, so what that mother did is this pragmatic choice I'm talking about, right? Like she prioritized the safety of her children and children like him over her desire for rage and vengeance. That mother comes into this circle, um, into the restorative justice circle where we bring together the person responsible, the person harmed, their support people to acknowledge what happened, acknowledge its impact and reach an agreement about how the responsible person can make things as right as possible. The circle goes on for hours and hours. Um, it eventually ends in agreements as 100% of our circles have. Um, and we start, everyone starts to go home. And the young man who committed this crime asked me if he could stay in the office a little longer. You know, by that point, I'd been in the office for 17 hours or something. And so I asked him why. Um, and he said, you know, I just don't want to go back outside until my hands stop shaking. Now, this is a kid who could hold a gun steady as day, like no tremble in sight. And he said, you know, for everything I've done and everything that's been done to me, I don't know that I ever heard a real apology before. Like, how do you think I did? And because it was true, I told him, you know, I think you did great. And he said, part of my language, but that was the scariest shit I ever did. I think we underestimate how difficult it is for us to face the harm that we've caused. And in underestimating that, we also underestimate how transformative it can be. Punishment seeks to reduce the power. It says someone's used their power wrongfully, and so what we need to do is eliminate that power. What restorative justice teaches us is that actually when we use our power wrongfully, we become obligated to use our power right. Like to use it in a way that corrects the pain we cause, that contributes to the community that we damage, that brings peace to the survivor whose life we upended, and to transform ourselves into people who won't cause that harm again. It is far harder work um, than the work of punishment, no matter, it is not as degrading, it is not as demeaning, but it is harder in every respect. The fourth principle that we believe should guide our responses to violence is that we believe responses to violence should be safety driven. We, that also sounds obvious. We talk about prisons all the time as though we do them to keep ourselves and each other safe. Um, but prisons have never produced the safety we deserve and they can't. You know, at the end of the day, I'm in the business of ending violence. Um, I come to this work as a survivor and, and if you want to end something, what you do is you look for the things that create it and you try and get rid of those things. It's like if there's a nasty smell in your house, you try and figure out where the smell is coming from and you throw that thing away. Um, and in my diligent work, looking through our culture for our sources of violence, I believe anyone who does that honestly and rigorously will find prison as one of the greatest sources in our country. So we know the core drivers of violence are structural. They are things like poverty, inequity, um, lack of decent social service infrastructure. Our investment in prison underscores, reinforces, escalates all of those things. But even on the individual level, the core drivers of violence are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and an inability to meet one's economic needs. The core features of prison are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and an inability to meet one's economic needs. So we have baked into our core responses to violence exactly the things that generate it. It's like showing up at a house fire with a hose full of gasoline. Like we should not act surprised when the flames rage higher. And it's supported by the research that overwhelmingly demonstrates that prison is criminogenic meaning that someone similarly situated who goes to prison becomes likelier to cause more and greater harm than someone who doesn't. You don't actually have to hate prisons to want to get rid of them in America. You have to hate violence to want to get rid of them. Um, you can be indifferent to whether, to the conditions of confinement, to what happens to people who cause harm. You can think they've broken 
they're part of the social contract and so aren't entitled to anything else. You can think all of that and still only from the question of what survivors deserve and what will keep us safe, arrive at the conclusion that we have to do something other than prison because prisons render us less safe. In common justice, we have all these opportunities to generate safety differently and to generate healing differently. So in one case, for example, um, the young man who um, the harm party, the survivor, um, was a young man. He worked in restaurants for cash. He was an immigrant to this country, not a native speaker of English. He was on his way home from work one day and the responsible party um, assaulted him, robbed him of his week's wages and traumatized him substantially. So this young man experienced all the classic symptoms of trauma, um, including hypervigilance, including nightmares and flashbacks and all of those things. Um, he would say that if he walked down the street, if anyone came up behind him, even a quote little old lady, that his mind would race and his heart would race and his stomach would turn. And because it was so difficult for him to be outside, he started taking cabs home from work, which cost him half of his income, which he certainly couldn't afford to lose. He stopped going anywhere he didn't absolutely have to. So stopped going to his ESL classes, stopped doing anything fun with his partner, stopped seeing the people he cared about in his life. And that isolation, of course, further exacerbated his trauma symptoms as happens. We come to the circle process and partway through the circle process, the responsible party says that he says every man older than me in my family has served at least 11 years in prison. He said, or at least 10 years in prison. He said, my older brother served 11. And each of those years, he won his like prison boxing league championship. And he says to this person he robbed, he says, you know, that night on the street, I showed you, and my, he said, my brother's the one who taught me how to fight. And that night on the street, I showed you the wrong end of that. But my brother is the one who taught me to defend myself too. And if you want, I can teach you that. And the little stick in a circle, you talk when you have it, you don't when you don't, it gets passed to the survivor and he says, I would love that. And because none of us had the stick, we couldn't say anything about whether we thought that made any kind of sense. Um, and so it becomes one of the agreements in the circle. We go to a martial arts studio, a dojo with a trained martial art professional, because one key to doing what you do well is to not pretend you know more than you do. Um, and with her supervision, this young man teaches the person he robbed these self-defense techniques. So first, he's standing as though he's being restrained and demonstrating sort of how to release himself from the grip. And then they switch positions. And this young man, the survivor, is being held not just in the same way, but by the same person who held him that night, because that has been the source of so much of his pain. And that young man is now coaching him through how to release himself from that grip. And first he's holding him gently as he practices and he's coaching him, no, a little to the left, a little here, harder, softer. Um, and eventually though, he's holding him with all his strength and over and over again, this young man is breaking free from it. We finish the session, everyone goes home. I check in with people that night, they seem okay. The next, the next afternoon I get a call on my cell phone from the survivor, which is usually just emergency calls. So I answer right away and he says, hi Danielle, I'm calling to tell you nothing happened which doesn't sound like an emergency. And so I said, can you say more? And he said, I just walked by a six foot four man and nothing happened. Like his mind didn't race, his heart didn't race, his stomach didn't turn. And so he went to Times Square in New York City because he had an hour before he had to be at work so that he could walk by as many people as possible. And he's on the street with me, he's on the phone being like, hold on, there's a tall one. He's running across, he's like, nothing, nothing. Tell me he doesn't deserve that. Like, I don't know on what moral basis we as a society could deny a survivor that healing if we know how to provide it, especially if the process that delivers that healing also has made that young man who harmed him the first man in his family never to serve a prison day, never to harm anyone else in the way he did that day. If we know how to do it, like how do you look in the face of a survivor and say, you can't have this because we believe in deterrence, because we believe in punishment for punishment's sake? Like, how dare we? And so I stand as somebody, every time I'm in a circle, 
I am so moved by the possibility of what we do and what it represents. And then always later that night, I become enraged. <laughs> My partner makes fun of me for it. Um, I become enraged because it is one thing for us to do the brutal inefficacy of incarceration if nothing else works. It is a whole different thing for us to continue to do that in the presence of solutions that work. It's like if you had the cure for cancer and you had some old thing you had tried that exacerbated symptoms and with the cure for cancer, like there beside you in a syringe, you inject people with something else that makes them sick, that makes them vomit, that doesn't relieve the symptoms, that doesn't cure the underlying disease. And how dare you? That's what we do in this country. We know how to address violence. It is available to us. And our job is to make a commitment to safety that will always exceed our commitment to political expedience. And we do that because we care about survivors. We do that because we care about each other. We do that because we care about our basic moral obligation to create a society in which everyone can be safe and thrive. The last principle we believe should guide our responses to violence are that responses to violence should be racially equitable. That has never been true in this country. It's important to say so. It has never been true. So when we say this, it's deeply aspirational, right? It's about becoming a country we have never been. You know, the evidence overwhelmingly demonstrates that at every decision point in the process, there are greater and greater racial disparities. So who is arrested with what, are they charged with? How is bail set? Like what ultimately are they indicted for? What are they convicted of? What are they sentenced to? Are they paroled? What are the terms of the parole? Are they violated on parole? Like at every one of those points, there is just demonstrable racial disparity everywhere all the time. Um, and we have to acknowledge that that's true. And we have to acknowledge the lineage between mass incarceration and the systems that precede it, including convict leasing, where after slavery ends, people, particularly in the South, though not only in the South, the economy is not structured to pay labor, right? Because there hasn't been, people haven't been paying for labor. And so all of a sudden there are these new major costs for businesses that they hadn't accounted for and can't manage to accommodate and still thrive. And so they introduce all these vagrancy laws and other kinds of laws, like vagrancy is like standing around unemployed. People get arrested for vagrancy, for jaywalking, for littering, for all these things. And then they're fined. And those fines exceed what they're able to pay. And so they are then leased out to so often the very same plantations where they or their parents were enslaved, um, where they in theory work off that debt. But as they work off that debt, they also have to pay for their housing there and pay for their food there. And the cost of those things exceed their wages. So they end up stuck in an, in an interminable servitude, right? Like that's the origin, that's where our criminal justice system starts. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's not about like what were people's evil intents. It's about really structurally, like where do we see the origins of mass incarceration and how do we account for the continuity between those practices and our practices today. Um, I believe we know this. I believe we have long known this about our country. This isn't news. Um, there are those of us who knew and those of us who should have known, and there is no other category. <laughs> like we are all implicated in it. And particularly all of us white folks are implicated in this. But as somebody who is in the work of transformation and repair, I believe in our capacity to reckon with this. I have watched people face the worst things they have ever done and come together to figure out a way to repair it. And I don't think the steps for our collective reckoning are actually different than the ones that we see on the individual level. I believe we have to acknowledge what we've done. We have to acknowledge its impact. We have to express genuine remorse. We have to make things as right as possible, ideally in a way defined by those harmed. And we have to become a people, a nation, who will never cause that harm ever again. I have yet to be in the circle process that the responsible person wasn't reluctant about entering, at least the day of. Um, people are late, the trains are late, they're nauseous, they're like, it's hard. Um, it's like, you know, you're crossing a river of fire and the thing I know about them, though, is that 
it's not just that they always result in something useful. In my experience, they do. It's that the thing they result in is never totally visible on this side of the reckoning. It's always different. It's always more. Um, it's something in that first part of the process where we tell the truth that makes it possible to imagine repair in ways we could not until the truth was told. And so this isn't like a plea bargain. It's not a thing where we say, if you admit that you were guilty, then this is going to be the punishment, right? In some ways for white folks, that'd be much easier. We're like, tell me the cost in advance and I will consider whether I will admit that I had part in this, right? It's different. The first requirement is that we enter into the reckoning, that we tell the truth and that we trust that that truth telling is our only way forward. I believe we still stand a chance to become a democracy in this, in this country and in a way we never fully have been. Like, I believe that is within reach for us, but I believe that there's no way forward but through that river of fire. And people who do restorative justice don't know everything about that. Um, but the thing that we do know that is maybe the most important is that it is entirely possible. And so I will stop there and open up for questions, discussion, insults, feedback, <laughs> whatever you all want to offer. Great. Um, thanks, Danielle. Um, what I love about your four principles um, you just laid out are that I, th I think they head on address all the um, skeptical responses that you hear to the idea of restorative justice. Um, you know, what about survivors? You know, what about holding people accountable? Um, you know, that that's not going to be safe. Restorative justice is just too soft. Um, uh, and it's it's not going to hold people accountable. Um, and, and you just do a great job of flipping that all on its head and showing why the current system is not doing those things. Um, I'm going to throw it just to get warmed up here. Uh, I didn't send you this question in advance, but I was um, looking through your book a little bit more again, and I saw that the first um, quote uh, you put in your book um, before the before the table of contents, even uh, one is it's from Maurice Sendak, and it is and the walls became the world all around. Let me say that again. And the walls became the world all around. Why did you choose that quote to start your book? It's funny for all the times I've talked about this book, no one has ever asked me that. Um, I have a toddler, so I have a copy of the book that it's from actually here, Lexi. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this text. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I think, um, you know, what happens in that book is he's in a room and as he imagines like the walls first, the trees start to grow and then eventually it turns into this forest. Um, and I think that we have built walls as our way to address harm. Like it's the thing that we have done. It's the only thing we've been able to mm -hmm. imagine. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have an opportunity to do something fundamentally different, to replace that confinement, to replace those like factories of despair with the world, with what we can be to each other, with holding people accountable in community, in relationship with building a world that makes harm unlikely in the first place and heals it when it happens, that responds to violence in ways that interrupts cycles of violence rather than making them almost completely inevitable. Like we can become a world that has very little violence and that when it occurs, like mends it. And I know that that's possible for us and that some of that is imagination from scratch, but like most imagination or imagination draws from things that are real, that we have seen, um, where we think about their expansion and their presence in spaces where we've never been allowed to, to dream of them being. And those, those walls are not just prison walls, are they? They're the walls of othering, the offender right. versus the victim. And, yeah. All of it, the notion that, like that, that those two categories make any kind of sense. Like if I yeah. told, if we were all in a room together, I would say to you, okay, everyone who's ever caused harm stand to my left and everyone who's ever been harmed stand to my right. And none of you, all of you would run back and forth or stand in the middle if you were being honest. Like we belong to both of these categories and our, the harm we sustain when it's not healed makes us likelier to hurt others. Like it's just true. The shame we feel when we hurt others makes us likelier to hurt others. Um, and so 
all of those notions, they're just false. And so we can debate them as though they're political beliefs, but they're not. Like they're just untrue. And if we build a system based on falsehoods, it's not going to produce the outcomes we claim it's going to produce. And so, yeah, it's those laws and it's the laws that, you know, I think sometimes I think the worst thing the criminal justice system has done is teach us to believe that we don't know what to do. Like the vast majority of harm gets mended without the criminal justice system doing anything. Sometimes in good ways, sometimes in sort of crappy ways, sometimes through ignoring it, they're not perfect, but very few of them are worse. Um, and so I think it also matters that we know that we have available to us a wide range of solutions that we always have. Um, and that those solutions, were we to invest anything in them on the scale of what we invest in policing and prisons, like the New York City Police Department, their annual budget is $10 billion a year with a B. One city, 10 billion a year. Do you know what we could do with that? Like the safety we could produce, the healing we could produce, we could reach back and forward across generations with resources at that scale. Um, and so some of it is also about not pretending that we have to imagine from scratch that the, the thing we're starting to work with is not a blank slate. What it is, is it's a collage, right? Like it's, it draws from all these existing practices that, that were they to be adequately resourced could grow to displace the system as we know it. Great. On that note, let's, um, let's switch to, uh, practical solutions, you know, how do we get there? The second quote of the two at the start of your book is a James Baldwin quote that says, we can make America what America must become. And I think that, you know, we're all here at this conference today because we all believe that, that we can change things um, and do something different. Um, but how we get there is, is the challenge, right? Um, and I, I know you were enabled, I don't think you were able to join us this morning um, for the conversation with, um, Rezma Menachim, the author of um, My Grandmother's Hands. And he spoke a lot about, and he does in his work about, you know, creating the culture that we need and that we need a container for these different ways of doing things and we don't have those containers. And, um, you know, those are, I, I firmly believe that, that, you know, we have to have cult, complete cultural change in a lot of these things, but I think, Sometimes when we start talking about cultural change, people kind of throw up their hands and go, well, how do you change culture, right? How do you change the culture of a police department? Um, and, you know, you talk about culture change a lot in your book. I think reckoning, the chapter at the end, is really about culture change. Um, but uh, I, I firmly believe that one of the ways we cult change culture is that we, at the same time, change policies and practices and programs, right? Because if you have the examples or if you change something to get a policy passed, you got to work on cultural change just to get that change, right? If you're going to, like here in Minnesota, I worked on um, banning the box years ago, taking the question about criminal records off the employment application. Like that doesn't change the culture by itself, but it creates a different conversation about how we value people um, who are applying for employment and have some kind of past and that leads to culture change. And so my point is that, you know, the a program like you're doing in New York, Common Justice, just the, you know, that's where cultural change can start is having the example in, in that pocket there. So, and I, we've already had some questions about, you know, the logistics of all of this. Um, could you just start, tell us about a little bit about the nuts and bolts, how the process works. You mentioned something about after a grand jury and, you know, how do you get referrals? How long does the process take? I mean, I know there's probably a lot to it and you can spend a lot of time that, but like kind of an overview. Sure. Yeah. And I think just to say, like, I think what you're saying about culture change resonates very much. Like if I ask you to describe your culture, some of what you would do is describe what you do. We gather in these ways. Mm -hmm. We do these things. Yeah. Like you wouldn't just say, this is what we believe in our culture. You would say like, it's characterized by these ceremonies, by these activities, by these kinds of relationships between generations, all of those things. So one of my mentors, Herb Stars, used to say a great way to learn something is by doing something. Um, and so I think absolutely like culture is partly its belief systems and those belief systems are connected to our actions and vice versa, right? It's always, mm -hmm. it's a very dynamic system. So concretely, 
Um, Common Justice works with the district attorney's office um, in indicted cases like robberies, assaults, and attempted murders. We get the consent of the district attorney and the survivor, and I talked about that consent earlier. And Danielle, are these uh, both juvenile and adult cases? Only adult. Only adult. Um, okay. In New York, our adults start at 16, that's 16 to 26 year olds. So okay. it's younger adults in the adult system. Um, we then, after, if the survivor says yes, which as I shared, 90% of them do, we screen the responsible party determine their willingness to participate to take responsibility for what they've done. If they do so, they enter a guilty plea to a felony and to an underlying misdemeanor. They enter into the program, which is usually 15 months. Occasionally, someone can finish in 12 months, but that requires a really exceptional trajectory through it. About three months, first they see us every, they see us five days a week um, for one-on-one -on -one sessions the bulk of which are focused on our violence intervention curriculum that supports our responsible parties and considering what they did, why they did it, what they owe to whom, um, where their ideas about violence were formed and what it would take to transform them, what their aspirations are for themselves, um, for others, and to prepare for the dialogue with the person they hurt. At the same time, we're working with that person to support them to come through what happened to them and in their lives generally and to explore with them whether they want to be in that dialogue. Most of them do. We then sit down either with the victim or with a surrogate because the survivor may not want to be present and they're not obligated to. And in that dialogue, we address what happened, address its impact and reach agreements about how to make things as right as possible. Those agreements typically comprise like three components, though we don't require this. It sort of happens every time naturally. Like one set of agreements are about things that are for the survivor. So apologies, restitution, um, acknowledgements to their family and others, those sorts of things, the replacement of stolen property. The second are things that are about the transformation of the responsible person. So going to school, getting a job, going to therapy, learning about their own culture, that sort of thing. And then the last is about paying it forward, is about the sort of shared recognition that there are others not in the room in the community who are affected by being in a community in which harm happened. And so that will be things like volunteering, doing community service, talking to other young people about how to make things right, writing things, putting things out in the world that create positive change. Those agreements then take usually the bulk of a year for a responsible party to fulfill that can take virtually all of their waking hours to do. Um, we will never diminish their dignity, but we will ravage their social lives happily. Um, and during that time, they see us three days a week where they're focused on their stability, like their income, their housing, their engagement in positive activities. And then they continue through a year long violence intervention curriculum that builds on what we did before the circle. At the end, if they're successful, the felony charges against them are dismissed um, and they're sentenced to what's called in New York, a conditional discharge on a misdemeanor. Um, so no further punishment. And then we continue to work with the survivor through this time, um, like through their healing process, through their stabilizing process, um, so that they can thrive in their lives as well. Wow, that is uh, intense. That's a, a lot of time. Um, and for the person who's uh, been pled guilty to this crime, harm someone, um, uh, prison sounds like it might be a little easier especially if it was just like yeah, six months, right? And you said 90% of victims choose this, what percentage of the uh, people who have offended? So everyone who has offered it has, I believe everyone has chosen it. There are some people like we don't take people who are innocent. So sometimes in the course mm -hmm. of our screening, it comes out that somebody hasn't committed the crime and then we won't take them. We do not take people who are actively using chemically addictive substances. We'll refer them to drug treatment because we find the cycle of that recovery is not compatible with the particular rigorous structure of our program. Um, but people take it because the alternative is they're doing five years in prison. And so I don't think people necessarily anticipate how difficult it will be. Um, and we're not crazy people. Like I'm not like, oh, everyone comes to common justice because all they wanna do is repair the harm they've caused. People come because they don't wanna go to prison, right? Mm -hmm. And then our job, is over the course of their time with us to shift from what we talk about as in extrinsic to intrinsic motivation. 
So to be motivated not by the threat of punishment from the court, but by your own desire to make things right, your own desire to live a life that gives you hope, like where you see a path for yourself, for your children, that is promising to you. Um, like most of us, the reason we don't kill people is not just because it's illegal, right? There are other things tied to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so our job is to foster that intrinsic motivation. So one of our first graduates, you know, now I know that, you know, fewer than 8% of participants on our watch have been terminated for new crimes. When our first person graduated, I had no idea what would happen, right? And so we were walking and I asked him and I was, you know, his nickname used to be the enforcer, not for enforcing high ethical standards. Um, and he graduated, we were walking back from court to our office at the time. And I, I asked him, I was like, so do you just go back now to doing what you used to do? Like now that the court is gone? And he said, nah. Yeah. And so I said, can you say more? And he said, it's just that the judge is in here now and like points to his heart. And this is not a young man who did a lot of heart pointing at the beginning of his time with us. Um, and that's the thing we aspire to because the truth is like, people can and do escape the police a lot. Like there are cities whose homicide clearance rates are as low as 10 or 15%, right? It means 90% of people who yeah. kill people get away with it, right? You can yeah. escape that. You can't escape yourself. And so um, in the fostering of that intrinsic motivation, it is like a much more reliable like producer of safety than any threat of force will ever yeah. be. Could you, did you say only 8% of your... Uh, people have been continue. terminated for new crimes on our watch. Okay. Yeah. Do you know what the um, the success rate after completion is? Uh, do you we have like anecdotal evidence about it. We are getting to, the, we are about to cross the threshold where we have enough people that we can get the state data in a way that is adequately de-identified. Ironically, that is difficult to do because so few people commit new crimes. Um, that it takes a much bigger pool before um, that data can be reliably yeah. anonymized. Yeah. yeah. How many cases are you able to handle on, say, an annual basis or? I mean, we take a, a few dozen a year. Okay. So still relatively small, though I think steadily growing. We were on a pretty steady uptick before COVID and then COVID made a lot of things different. And so we're now starting to ratchet back up. And I, I didn't, I, I, maybe you said this, but I didn't catch it. I was too busy thinking about questions. But um, how are they referred? Do the prosecutors refer them or do you look at The prosecutors at can, see? defense attorneys can, survivors okay. themselves can, community members okay. can. So they come, judges can. So they come to us yeah. through a wide variety of doors. Yeah. Well, what do you say to people who, you know, look at something like this and go, you know, we just, with all the people that we have going through our justice system, you know, the resources this takes, you know, in a place like New York, you've, I mean, I don't want to, to minimize your sure. work at all, but a few dozen is not very many. Like, it's just too, we just don't have the resources for this. It's too time intensive. Yeah, I mean, virtually nothing is more expensive than prison. Mm -hmm. So, like, we should be clear. Sometimes I think the most radical question we could ask, like, that would change our personal lives, our public lives, our policy. So like, it's a big claim to say this is one question. Yeah. Sometimes I think like the most transformative question we could ask is compared to what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's yeah. really like we have to be honest about how much we spend on a system that has, depending on you, how you count it, an 80% failure rate just basically on recidivism. And then if you count its sort of human failure, its failure to heal victims, all of those things, a far worse success rate. And we spend astronomical amounts of money. Like, I don't know your per person cost, but in most states, it's somewhere between 30 and $250,000 a year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, what we're doing is extraordinarily expensive and it generates more violence. So it's like, if you go to a mechanic because there's like a weird sound under the hood of your car and they clink something at that sound, and then they pour a bunch of acid into your engine and you leave and your car catches on fire. And then you're like, I have to go back now to that same mechanic because it's the closest one. And there's one version where you say like, thank goodness the mechanic was so close, right? Like that's how we talk about criminal justice. We're like, thank goodness we have mm -hmm. a mechanic or what would we do? As opposed to being like, I had a little rattle in my engine before and now this thing is on 
buyer. Um, like it is generative of its own business. So the other thing when we think about this question of scale is to realize that if we have solutions to violence that reduce future violence, ultimately we have a lot less work to do, right? Like right now, our response to violence makes almost inevitable the fact that we will have to continually respond to that same behavior for as long as that person lives. That's mm -hmm. a lot of work. If our, like that responsible party in the story with the self-defense class hasn't brought any business back to the criminal justice or correction system in the more than decades since that happened. And so as we invest in solutions that work, we shrink what is incoming into that system to a level that becomes actually sustainable for a culture. Because the amount we spend now that we are borrowing from the collective pool that we could spend on schools and hospitals and other basic human needs is unconscionable. Like the scale of it is wild. Like we could eliminate hunger in this country if we shrank prisons to the levels they were in the 70s. Just that. So not yeah. shrink them to some unimaginable number. If we brought our prison populations down to what they were in the 70s, we could end hunger. Like it's, we could end homelessness. We could do all of these things as a culture. And if we end hunger and end homelessness, we are also doing a great deal to end crime. Um, what's been your biggest challenge at Common Justice? Funding? <laughs> I mean, no, I think, you know, our biggest challenge has been the notion that people who commit violence are somehow like out of the scope of reform, mm. out mm. of the scope of diversion, out of the scope of being able to transform. You know, like a basic belief that someone who's committed violence can and will only ever commit more violence. Um, and this story, this myth that when we incarcerate people, we're doing right by crime victims. Um, and so we have all these people doubling down on solutions that are harmful to victims in victims' names. And so those two stories are probably the biggest challenges we face. And are those, where, are, where are those stories like most, have the most power? Is it with prosecutors? Or everywhere, funders everywhere. Or everywhere. Prosecutors, okay. judges, mm -hmm. defense attorneys, court mm -hmm. officers, your Thanksgiving table, like everywhere. You know, yeah. like that's the, yeah. it's the culture level part that is, um, and the problem is that cultural context creates a context in which system actors feel risk averse about diverting violence because they believe that if they divert violence and something goes poorly that they will lose their jobs. Like mm -hmm. there's a sort of famous case of Willie Horton that you know ruined Michael Dukakis's career and everything else. The program Willie Horton, the work release program he was in had a 99% success rate. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not about data and it's not about overall outcomes. Yeah. And so there's a political fear. And I think the only way to resolve that is through organizing. If you have an organized base of people who have made clear to their elected officials that what they want is for them to keep them safe and end mass incarceration at the same time, then those elected officials become obligated to do brave things to end mass incarceration mm -hmm. because their jobs depend on it. And so the thing that does the most to change the conditions of, of the, the, the thing that does the most to change the decisions of prosecutors are the surrounding political conditions. And the thing that does the most to change those political conditions is organizing. Um, one quick uh, question from the audience here is, are certain crimes like domestic violence or sexual assault ineligible? So we don't work with those crimes. That's not because we think they're worse or that restorative justice can't work for them. It's because they're different. And one of the problems with incarceration is it treats a thousand different problems as though they're the same as each other. Um, mm -hmm. And so there is increasingly really valuable, visible work happening in applying restorative justice to both domestic violence and sex crimes. I think that work is critically important. Um, it's just like, if you're an oncologist, you're working on cancer, and so that doesn't mean you're working on Parkinson's. Um, and that's not because you're competing about which disease you think is worse, it's just you know there are things those things have in common and things that are different. And so I hold the work happening on that in really high regard. It's just not the work we do. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think I'm, I'm covering most of the questions we've got from the audience. I hope um, 
that's the case. Um, there's one about restorative justice work in prisons, but that's um, it's probably a topic for a different conversation if um, Ash Ashworth asks that. I could, you know, talk about what's being done here in Minnesota. Are you doing any work in prisons, Danielle? I've done a ton of work in prisons personally, but common justice isn't work in prisons. Yeah. Um, like we are really interested in displacing them as a site yeah. of mm -hmm. accountability and healing. Mm -hmm. So similarly, mm -hmm. I have, there's mm -hmm. powerful work happening. I respect it highly. That work is always people are working with both hands and one leg tied behind their backs, you know, um, yeah. like the structure of prison is not designed to support this kind of transformation. And so for us, we were like, rather than work with both hands and our leg tied behind our back in doing it, like, what if we untied ourselves and each other um, so that we could yeah. do this in the way that is most possible? Yeah. Well, I'm getting a two minute warning here. I might take three. Um, uh, thank you so much, Danielle. This has been excellent. I hope we can continue the conversation, you know, offline. And as people here are interested in this work more, they'll um, read your book and look at what Common uh, Justice is doing. Um, in, in closing, I appreciate um, you know your your um, suggestion, advice to organize for work on organizing. Um, but in closing, let you you actually you were a prosecutor as well, right? Well, I thought mm -hmm. you had done some prosecution work. I'm thinking no. of somebody else. I'm well, let, try to put you know, <laughs> you know prosecutors though. I know, you know what they some of my with, best friends. Right? Are You've talked about the politics of this. Put yourself. Um, Pretend that you're a chief prosecutor here in in uh, in Minnesota, and you want to do more of this restorative justice work. I mean, you want to do it sort of from the top down, but there's all these political considerations. Um, you know, you talked about organizing grassroots. Like, what can somebody, whether it's a prosecutor or anybody in the system who has that power, what advice would you give them around starting a program like this? I mean, I think there are two main things I would say. You know, one is that. Um, you as an elected official you want to keep your job this is understandable most of us want to keep our jobs um and so you have to ensure that whatever voters you think you may lose to this first of all confirm that that's right confirm that that's not an outdated assumption based on politics that are no longer true so do some polling and check that you're not overestimating the punitiveness of a base that you've relied on and then you need to think about building a different base. And that means listening to people in the neighborhoods where you do most of your work, in the neighborhoods where you've incarcerated the most people, and not just to whoever comes to the, like, the community board meeting at the precinct, because that is a subset of that neighborhood, but build your base in the neighborhoods affected by your choices. And those constituents will protect you if you make these kinds of choices. Because one person in a program failing dramatically has nothing on all the people who return home from prison and fail dramatically. And so, and the people in those neighborhoods will know that. So some of it is about base building strategy, constituency building strategy for electeds, um, because then your, your job will be secure and it will be secured by the people who depend on the outcome of your work. And that puts you in a space of like real representative democracy where you're not making decisions for black and brown neighborhoods based on the risk tolerance of wealthy white ones you're making decisions for black and brown neighborhoods based on their own risk tolerance for themselves and their children. And then the second thing I would say is that, you know, I think people really under appreciate how much being a prosecutor is a management gig. You know, like you don't make most of the decisions in cases like your ADAs do all down the line. And so it's also about really understanding the labor of shifting the culture of prosecutors offices. Um, toward a different set of goals. That doesn't mean you go from a set of goals of getting convictions to a set of goals of freeing them all. Like, I mean, if that's mm -hmm. your trajectory, right. great. It means identifying that your core goals are going to be secure safety, to meet the needs of survivors, and to do it in a way that is fair. That is not that different from how most people have conceived of their goals. But the idea that convictions and lengthy sentences are an accurate proxy for those broader goals is untrue. And so it means really anchoring in what is the point? Like what was the, when you thought to secure all those convictions at the greatest possible length, why was that goal set? And if that was fundamentally about safety, 
and about both meeting the needs of people who had been harmed and preventing others and recentering in those goals and venturing against those goals, it will drive you to doing more diversion than you otherwise would. And it's the sort of thing that offices will come along, but you need champions within those offices. You need deaf people at the like first assistant and deputy levels who are really ready to move that culture shift. You have to incentivize behavior that aligns with it and have negative consequences for behavior that doesn't like it's a management gig um, and it's important. I think we the public often thinks about a prosecutor like a senator um, or a city mm -hmm. council person mm -hmm. like all they're doing is voting yes or no on something. Um, and it's an extraordinarily difficult management job. And so some of it is like not underestimating the challenges of that management and making sure you have the right partners in doing it. Great. Well, we need to wrap up. Um, on behalf of the thank Minnesota you. Justice Research Center and everybody here today, I want to thank you for joining us today, Danielle, and, and even more so thank you for your great work. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much for having me.